Hello and welcome to a mini lecture about the Kaufman bracket, the Rive and Reidermeister moves. Uh, the Kaufman bracket is something we've seen in a previous mini lecture. Uh, it's one of the ingredients in the definition of the Jones polynomial. The Rive, we haven't seen yet, but I'll define it for you. It's the other ingredient in the definition of the Jones polynomial. And finally, uh, I'm going to tell you how these two ingredients change under the Reidermeister moves. Um, they're not invariants of links. They will change under the Reidermeister moves. But the point is that they're going to change under the Reidermeister moves in a similar way, so that when we count, when we combine them, the Kaufman bracket and the Rive, to make the Jones polynomial, those ways that they change under the Reidermeister moves are going to cancel each other out. And we're going to get a good, decent invariant of knots. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, let me remind you about the Kaufman bracket. It's an invariant of diagrams, and it's characterized by the fact that it doesn't change under uh, smooth deformations of the diagrams, and that it satisfies these three axioms, k1, k2, and k3. So k1, you remember, told you that the uh, if you take this diagram of the unknot, not any other diagram of the unknot, then the Kaufman bracket is 1. k2 tells you that if you uh, take an, any diagram you like, d, and then next to it place this diagram of the unknot, uh, then what you get is the Kaufman bracket of your old D times by this big factor here. And then K3 tells you that if you have a diagram with a crossing in it, then uh, you can smooth that crossing in two different ways, this one and that one, and the Kaufman bracket of the diagram with the crossing in it is A times the first smoothing, the Kaufman bracket of the diagram smooth that way, plus A inverse times the Kaufman bracket of the diagram with the second smoothing. And uh, just down here, there's a couple of examples, um, and you can look through them. Uh, you can pause the video and read through them if you want. The point is that these are both diagrams of the unknot, but their Kaufman brackets are different. So pause it and look through that if you want to. Uh, now let me tell you what the rive is. The rive is extremely simple. The rive of a diagram of an oriented link is the sum of the signs of the crossings. It's the sum over all the crossings. Mm, this is not like the linking number. We don't care how many components meet at each crossing. We just sum over all of them. Uh, it's the sum of the signs of the crossings. Uh, so here are a couple more examples. And again, pause and convince yourselves of those if you wish. I want to end with a warning because it seems to be frequently uh, misunderstood that these little symbols that I've been drawing, like this one, and this one here, these are not diagrams. They represent diagrams. In particular, the one on the left, well, you can see one crossing in the little picture, but it represents a diagram with an arbitrary number of crossings, one of which is the one in the picture. right? And then the second image represents that same diagram, but with that crossing, that one favored crossing, replaced by something else, this smoothing. So don't mistake these for, for complete diagrams, because they're not. OK, so let's move on and see how these things change under the Reidermeister moves. Um, well, the first rule for the Kaufman bracket says that if you apply R1 to something on the left, then you get the Kaufman bracket of the same diagram, but with the kink removed. So this little this thing that looks like a 1, this is actually a diagram. <laughs> this, is, this is a symbol like this one but with the crossing removed, uh, multiplied by minus a to the minus 3, so with this factor at the front. Similarly for the rive, the rive, uh, if you apply r1, changes in a simple way, just by subtracting 1. Uh, secondly, r1 does not, sorry, secondly, the Kaufman bracket does not change under r2. Neither does the rive, it doesn't change. And finally, the uh, Kaufman bracket does not change under r3, neither does the rive. And for the rive, these are all regardless of the orientations, because the diagrams have to have been oriented for me to work out the rive at all. So now let me try to tell you something about why uh, this rule holds for the R2. And the way I'm going to try and explain it is by taking what we started with and using the axioms 
to turn it into the thing on the right. So let's start by applying K3 to this diagram. So K3 is going to tell us that this Kaufman bracket is equal to the sum of two other ones. A times one plus A inverse times another. And what do I do? Well, I have to take that crossing in the original one and smooth it in two different ways. So I'd like you now to pause the video and decide how I should complete these diagrams with the little vacuums in them. Uh, how should I fill in those gaps uh, according to K3? So pause it and decide how I should complete the diagrams. And the answer is, in order to view this crossing as the one that appears in K3, I have to turn my head 90 degrees to the right, in which case the positive smoothing is this one, and the negative smoothing is that one. OK, so I've turned the left-hand side into this quantity on the right. And actually, because uh, I've tried making this video several times before and I've run out of space every time, so I'm going to erase that and move this to the left. And so let's see how we can now change this. So this is going to be equal to, uh, let's move to the left a bit. This is going to be equal to, what shall I do next? Well, what I want to do next is I want to apply K3 to this uh, crossing here in the first term. So let's move him out of the way. Let's insert a great big parenthesis and let's write in here what would happen if we applied k3 well it would be a times one thing plus a inverse times another what are those things well they're the ones I get by smoothing the crossing out in two ways pause decide how I should f complete these diagrams I just erased parts of what should I put in here what should I put in there? So the answer is that this crossing here is already the positive way up. And so I, I make the positive smoothing like this, and I make the negative smoothing like that. There. So that's what I get by applying K3. And let's move up again. Nope, no room. OK, so what is this quantity now? Well, uh, remember that the Kaufman bracket is invariant under um, smooth deformations, so I can just smooth that bit out. And let me expand the bracket. So this A becomes an A squared. This A inverse evaporates to become no coefficient at all. And this term here stays where it is. OK, so let's keep going now. Um, what will I do next? Well, I can see two things I could do. One is I could apply K2 to this floating unknot diagram here and remove it. Or I could apply K3 in there, in the crossing in the right-hand term. And I'm going to do it by starting off with the K2. So what I'll get is what I had before. I'm going to make some space there, except I'm going to replace this with minus a to the minus 2 minus a squared times what I get by eradicating the unknot. And then look carefully, this term here is the same as minus this term here. So I can remove those. Goodbye you, goodbye you. And now I've simplified things somewhat. So that was by K2. Let's keep going. Next step. What shall I do now? Now I have to write, now I have to apply K3 to the remaining crossing. So let's 
leave these guys as they were, except here, I'm going to apply K3. So I'm going to get A times the first thing plus A inverse times the second, where the first one is where I smooth positively, and the second is where I smooth negatively. There we go. And well, uh, that's going to simplify nicely because this term, well, let me just redraw and expand the brackets. Because this is going to become, whoops, this is going to become plus a to the minus 2. And remember, I can deform this bit away until it looks more pleasant, like that. And these are going to cancel each other out. And now I have this first term is minus the last one. So actually, that's equal to what I have in the middle, which is just this, as required. So sorry that that took so long. Um, Uh, it, it actually looks nicer in the notes. I don't know why this was so painful for us, um, but there you go. So that's the explanation for what happens with R2. Let's, uh, and the Kaufman bracket, let's do the same thing for the ride briefly before we finish. Why would this be true? Well, this one's much easier. What's the writhe, what's the writhe of this? Well, this symbol here represents a large diagram which has two special crossings that look like this. So what is that? Well, if I sum up all the crossings that I can't see in this little bit of the image, then that's exactly the, sign, the same as the writhe of this. Uh, but then I have to add on the contributions from the two crossings you can see there. So if we called this crossing C and this one D, then what we would get would be the ride of the previous one plus the sine of C plus the sine of D. Uh, but regardless, but regardless of orientations, sine C equals minus sine d. Whatever happens, they're opposite in sine. And so the right-hand side is in fact just this term here. And so that's the end of that proof. And that's the end of the mini lecture.